Okay, so today we're doing a video on capitalism. I don't really have a ton of education on making a judgment on this. So I'm hoping that this next video will give me some clarity on whether it's good or bad or just kind of harmful. I don't know. Like, I, I can never really decide. So this is called Why It's So Hard to Imagine Life After Capitalism. And it's by Second Thoughts, which is a decent channel. I think we've done one video from them before. So yeah, let's get started. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Get your first month absolutely free when you sign up using the link below. Almost every discussion of capitalist realism starts with either a description of a book, a movie, or with a quote. So here's all three oh, at the okay. same time. In the movie The Usual Suspects, Kevin Spacey's character quotes French writer Charles Baudelaire when he says, The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Capitalism works the exact opposite way. Today, capitalism is the only thing that exists. For the last 30 plus years, nothing uh, but capitalism has ever been allowed space. So he's comparing that to the devil. Look, I don't have an opinion. I don't know yet. Let me get to the end at least to see if I can form one. Public consciousness. We live in a time where there's a quote, widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it. It's a feeling about the True. world that's probably best captured by British PM Margaret Thatcher who famously said, there is no alternative. Or by political scientist Francis Fukuyama, who declared that we've arrived at the end of history. Or even by nominally socialist labor politician Tony Blair, who said that we live in a post-ideological society, where there is no longer a left-wing or a right-wing management mm. of the economy, only economic policy that works. There are- See, I don't know what to take seriously because politicians, they just say whatever benefits them in the end. A lot of so, quotes this episode. Capitalist realism is this idea that we've hit the end of the line in terms of economic models, and now politics can be about making the terminus look a little nicer. And it's not hard to see just how hegemonic that feeling is. Just earlier this year, when baby formula shortages triggered a countrywide oh, yeah. scramble, Mayor Pete had his own little capitalist realism moment, for example. He said, quote, this is a capitalist country. The government does not make baby formula, nor should it. Companies make formula. For okay. Pete, the very idea that even in a crisis, anything but a market solution to a problem could be suggested was inconceivable. Like he said, it's just not what capitalist countries do. Well, okay, I remember this baby form formula thing happening. It was like a crisis for a little bit. And capitalist realism is a feeling that's inside us as much as it's in political discourse. Almost every week on this channel, I will critique some aspect or consequence of the capitalist economic model. And oh, almost see. every week, I'll see a well-intentioned comment saying something to the effect of, capitalism might be flawed or even downright cruel, but at the end of the day, it's the best we've got. After all, hasn't everything else been tried and failed? For most generations growing up after the 80s, our political imagination begins and ends with capitalism. I would like to know an alternative. If, if capitalism isn't great, I want to know what we should do. Heart I haven't watched that many videos on this channel, only that one from before. So I didn't know that every week this person posts anti-capitalist videos. So I am curious. Really anyone defends it wholesale. But while capitalism can certainly be resisted, critiqued, and even modified, there is a deep-seated belief within most of us who have lived through the neoliberal era that while capitalism has some wiggle room, it can't actually be overcome. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. This week, we're going to focus on that idea for a while. We're going to look at how capitalist realism gets anchored in society, what mm -hmm. political purpose it serves, and how we can try to overcome it and actually have a little bit of freedom in our political and economic imagination. First, we should talk about how we're all okay. poisoned with this idea. And the place to start is with the death of alternatives. Hardly anyone thinks capitalism is really handling the world all that well. The global wealth gap keeps growing, environmental collapse wow. is more likely each and every year, social services keep getting gutted, and we live in a perpetual state of economic crisis, recession, or inflation, depending on the year. Things are pretty bad, and there are clear ways in which an economic model that seeks growth and profit at all costs 
backed up by the most powerful governments in the world, at the very least seriously contributes to the mess we're in. But still, in the back of your mind, <laughs> some part of you can't really imagine anything better. French but philosopher I don't know anything. Alain Badiou probably captured this aspect of capitalist realism the best, saying, quote, We live in a contradiction. A brutal state of affairs, profoundly inegalitarian, where all existence is evaluated in terms of money alone, is presented mm -hmm. to us as ideal. To justify their conservatism, the partisans of the established order cannot really call it ideal or wonderful. So instead, they have decided to say that all the rest is horrible. Sure, they say, we may not live in a condition of perfect goodness, but we're lucky that we don't live in a condition of evil. Our democracy is not perfect, hmm. but it's better than the bloody dictatorships. Capitalism is unjust, but it's not criminal like Stalinism. We let millions of Africans die of AIDS, but we don't make racist nationalist declarations like Milosevic. Huh? Okay. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. That's a whole other topic. So they're saying it's better than nothing, basically. All these quotes. We better kill than Iraqis nothing. with our airplanes but we don't cut their throats with machetes like they do in Rwanda." End quote. If things are bad, at least we should be grateful that they could be worse. And right. this is a very effective rhetorical strategy. Because with this perspective we adopt over years of repetition, even critiques of capitalism can end up reinforcing capitalist realism. Since all the alternatives have been painted as so irredeemably, inexcusably evil, so devoid of complexity yeah. or reason, so one-sided and deterministic. When we criticize capitalism, supposedly the best system of all, we are actually digging an even deeper hole for everything else. After all, if capitalism can be this awful, just imagine how hellish anything else must be. Okay, that's not the case. That's what he's saying, that's not the case. But what are the options? I want to know, please. And that's only one part of the way capitalist realism becomes normalized and so ingrained in our minds. For capitalism to have this kind of unquestionable status as the only viable economic system, we're not just told it's the best we have, it's even more fundamental than that. It's just the way the world works. Mm. Capitalism isn't even the best choice between a rock and a hard place. It's not a choice at all. It's natural. Resisting it is as pointless as trying to resist the laws of physics. There are a million different ways this idea manifests, but probably the most famous one is that capitalism is little more than a reflection of human nature. It's often repeated that humans are naturally greedy, naturally competitive, yeah. naturally selfish, like all other animals, and therefore nothing but capitalism could ever coexist with human nature. It's an idea that stems from two things. A really vague description of capitalism being the only economic system with things like competition or self-interest, and the idea that human nature and the natural world more generally only reward one thing. Competition. We're getting deep here, so I'm not saying much. But it almost feels like all of that's true. It kind of feels like, like that. Everything's competitive. But let's quickly dismiss both these ideas. Capitalism is a specific economic system, with specific criteria, and it's only existed for a very short time. It's not competition, greed, markets, freedom, or any other vague one-word definition. Capitalism can be distinguished from previous and future economic models by at least three things. One, the existence of capital. In simple terms, mm -hmm. money with the primary purpose of growth instead of money that's just a method of accounting or exchange, for example. Two, private okay. property. The ownership by single individuals of the means of economic production, meaning things like factories, businesses, farms, and so on are owned privately instead of collectively, and are therefore subjected to the decisions of the necessarily outnumbered class that owns them. And three, wage labor. The class without private property sells its labor to the class with private property for a wage. Markets, competition, self-interest, and so on all existed long before capitalism, and there's a good chance they'll exist after. But they do not hey. define it. Otherwise, we'd have a really imprecise and impractical definition. Now the second part of that equation. 
Competition and greed aren't uniquely natural or the defining feature of human nature. You've They're certainly not? heard Darwin's theory of evolution being described with the sentence survival. It feels that way, to be honest. It feels like we've always tried to get one up on each other throughout human history. Of the and while evolution is a matter of scientific fact, this specific framing of evolution being the product of competition, with the intentional slip up between two definitions of fittest, is neither neutral nor scientific. When Darwin was writing about evolution, he wasn't doing it in a vacuum. Highly influenced by the writings of economist Thomas Sorry. Malthus, Darwin <laughs> saw in evolution the features of a capitalist economy he was reading about at the time, and framed his writing with that in mind. It's not some accident that defenders of capitalism find its features in the Darwinist explanation of evolution. It was written with capitalism in mind. This is not to say that competition isn't a feature of the natural world, nor is it absent from so-called human nature. But mm -hmm. it is clearly not the only thing that drives how the world works. As the anarchist Peter Kropotkin observed in ants, bees, birds, rodents, ruminants, monkeys, and plenty of other species, quote, as soon as we study animals, we at once perceive that though there is an immense amount of warfare and extermination going on amidst various species, and yeah. especially amidst various classes of animals, there is at the same time as much, or perhaps even more, of mutual support, mutual aid, and mutual defense amidst animals belonging to the same species, or at least to the same society. Sociability what? is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle. But then we come to the same conclusion. We come to the same conclusion. We're always going to be fighting each other and having our little groups that we like to be in. That's what I got from that, at least. And it's not just animals. Humans are selfless all the time. People, without yeah. thought, payment, or self-interest, jump in rivers to save total strangers from drowning, yes. create mutual aid networks, and collaborate with no expectation of equivalent return. If greed is a natural part of how humans and nature work, so is selflessness. The existence of greed is not reason enough to build an economy that rewards it. It's not a reason, but it's just, it seems like it's almost inevitable with that point. Because there are people who also don't feel that way and don't just want to help selflessly. So they're always going to be fighting to get the top, to the top too. To put it another way, only observing humans under capitalism and concluding it's in our nature to be greedy is the equivalent of only observing us underwater and concluding it's in our nature to drown. I'm sorry, I keep pausing. I pause a lot. But like I said, well, those people are going to be working hard to get to the top. And that's why they have so many at the top who have so much money because they're willing to get it through non-selfless means <laughs> i hope it makes sense sometimes i don't um explain myself that thoroughly when I, I it goes differently in my mind so i hope it makes sense yet still if capitalism survived all this time we're told it's because it's just the natural order of the world so many uh, okay. explanations of the success of capitalism in becoming hegemonic when alternative economic models, specifically socialism, have failed, have this manifest destiny kind of logic to them. The development of capitalism, when you listen to its advocates, rarely acknowledges historical circumstances, like the geographic isolation of the first countries where capitalism took root, or the success of Which liberal ones? revolutions, the absence of global oh. ideological and economic competitors during the period of initial development, the support of the feudal, monarchical order that preceded it, the coinciding technological developments that allowed for the enslavement of an entire continent's labor in the process of primitive accumulation, or the crushing of socialist projects in coups, assassinations, mm -hmm. invasions, and wars in economically and militarily less developed states. Instead, the simple explanation right. that's repeated ad nauseum is that capitalism works because it's the way the world works. Sometimes gorillas punch each other, and that's why you deserve to be poor. This natural explanation is totalizing. It has no logical limits, and it leads to thinking of everything in terms of capitalism and business. Here, Trump is probably the best example of this, with his 2016 campaign taking capitalist realism to its logical endpoint by saying he would run the government like a business. Embedded uh -huh. in that sentence Which is, is already done. <laughs> It's kind of already done that way, by the way. It's not like it's not like that's something new. 
<laughs> the idea that the logic of businesses, markets, profit-seeking, and so on naturally lead to the most desirable outcomes in any situation. And you can add onto this list of the ways capitalist realism functions the equally widely disseminated idea that it's just simple pragmatism to believe in capitalism. Everything else is gross and ideological. And ideological means okay. bad. And to make that point, here's a quote from the raccoon of ideology himself, Slavoj Žižek. At this point, we reach the supreme irony of how ideology functions today. It appears precisely as its own opposite, as a radical critique of ideological utopias. The predominant ideology today <sighs> is not a positive vision of some utopian future, but a cynical resignation, an acceptance of how the world really is accompanied by a warning that, if we want to change it too much, only totalitarian horror can ensue. Oh, this is a really smart video. I need a minute. I need to read it again. Right. Okay. All together, these different narratives try to establish the idea that capitalism is neutral in its existence, that it is welded to the structure of reality. Socialism or communism, those are imposed on top of the real world. They're just ways to try and change the world away from how it really is, to impose an ideology on reality. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> I think it's all a choice, kind of how we end up. We still choose, is my point. It's This video is too intelligent for though. me. Capitalism <laughs> is reality. It's neutral. It's not ideological. It's yeah. just how the world works. And the benefit of capitalist realism is just how successfully it shields capitalism from crisis. Crises are a regular feature in any society, but capitalism has a built-in mechanism that leads it to crisis every five or ten years. The competing okay. logic of reducing costs and increasing sales almost always leads to a crisis of overproduction under capitalism, where, over time, hmm. workers don't make enough money to participate in the economy at a rate that keeps profits coming in. Regardless, hmm. whether it's a mostly internal crisis like that of overproduction, or one triggered by a relatively unpredictable event like a global pandemic, crises are often moments where capitalism comes into the foreground and faces the risk of being challenged. The benefit of capitalist realism in these moments is that it suppresses the revolutionary idea of transitioning away from capitalism to another economic model, and favors explanations of the crises that don't mention capitalism. If capitalism is the ground that the world is built on, not an economic model that we can decide if we want to keep, it will never be questioned. But I need you to tell me the alternative. What do we do then? Okay, you're saying it's bad. That's fine, but what do we do? Because, and also I'm an average person. <laughs> I need it in simple terms, please. And um, fascism in particular is an ideology that benefits from this aspect of capitalist realism, since it works by attributing any problem in society mm -hmm. not to a structural feature of that society, but to its corruption by some outside group of quote-unquote wrong kind of people. To quote Todd McGowan, fascism views the crisis as an anomaly that one might repair, while emancipatory politics sees the crisis as the moment at which capitalism reveals the truth of its distortion. And just to be clear, here repair is very euphemistic. Repair to a fascist means killing, deporting, or imprisoning oh. those whose identity has been selected as the cause of the distortion and crisis. No, we capitalist <laughs> that was a random. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> can quite literally stop us from seeing the root of some of our problems, and can either lead us only to band-aid solutions or genocidal cataclysms. So, how do we combat this idea that capitalism is all there is? Well, there are a couple ideas. The first, from Mark Fisher, is to demystify concepts like the economy. We made the economy up. We can choose to make it work another way. We mm -hmm. are allowed to question the rhetoric that says things like austerity, inflation, and recessions are out of our control. They're mm -hmm. not. We don't always have to be on the back foot. We can anticipate these things and control the economy in a democratic way. Same goes for ideas like privatization. There's nothing mandatory about privatizing a government service. Not everything can or should be run for profit. Not everything can I... be put up for sale. There isn't a market for everything. And the purpose of human government isn't to turn over more and more of our existence to capitalist forces. 
oh, I feel bad. He's really smart. And like, yeah, I get it. We don't have to accept it. But like, we can't even get everyone to agree that the world's round. So how do we get people to understand this this concept of fighting for the economy that we want? Like, I just don't think that's going to happen, sadly. Yeah, I'm a skeptic. I'm always a skeptic on everything. I annoy everyone around me by questioning everything. So here I am questioning this because there's no way to get people to focus on such a thing. And finally, we need to build an alternative, a communist realism. In Mark Fisher's words, the Ooh. concept of communist realism also suggests a particular kind of orientation. This isn't an eventalism, which will wager all its hopes on a sudden and final transformation. It isn't a utopianism, which concedes anything realistic to the enemy. It is about soberly and pragmatically assessing the resources that are available to us here and now, and thinking about how we can best use and increase those resources. It is about moving, perhaps slowly but certainly purposively, from where we are now to somewhere very different. Somewhere very different. Listen, I bet, I bet people are going to have some words on this. <laughs> Y'all can let me know in the comments. Um, even just using the word communism is like a, like a, a red flag word for everybody. So, yeah. In case you couldn't tell from all the quotes, this episode was inspired by Mark Fisher's phenomenal work, Capitalist Realism. If you enjoyed this week's episode and you'd like to learn more about just how ingrained this notion of capitalist realism is in our modern society, I highly recommend you check it out. I, I try that. my best to learn and understand as much as I can about topics like these so that I can explain them the way I wish I could have had them explained to me back when I was first learning about this stuff. And my personal favorite way to do that is by listening to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. I struggle to sit down Audible. and read a book. But with Audible, I can get through my very long list of titles, all while running errands, or working mm -hmm. out, or tidying my perpetually messy office. I, Dude, I love Audible while cleaning. It's just the best. I just finished listening to Capitalist Realism again, and I cannot stress enough just how critical it's been in helping me wrap my head around this topic. There's seriously <laughs> no better place to start, in my opinion. As an added bonus, when you sign up for Audible using my link, you get to pick a free audiobook every month. Yours to keep even if you cancel your subscription. Listening to Audible has completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's topic, I highly recommend you check out Capitalist Realism on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. So if you want to help support my channel mm -hmm. so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash second thought or text second thought, one word, to 500, 500 New members can try Audible absolutely free for 30 days. It really does help support me and my channel. Get started by following the link below or by texting second thought to 500 500. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous <laughs> content by following the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Well, I'm still, I'm confused. I, I don't have a definitive answer on um, capitalism is good or if it's bad. I don't know. Okay, we all need to get together to help change the economy. That's. <laughs> That's like moving an entire mountain, you know. Let me know what y'all think. If if some of y'all have more knowledge on this topic than me. I thought I would have like a strong opinion at the end of this video, but I really don't. Um, I don't feel educated enough to comment too deeply on it. That's the honest truth. Like, I don't like to give false facts or anything yeah so i'll leave this video for you in the description this channel has um let's see these three videos why hearing both sides is dangerous huh listen this is a a, a deep thinking channel if y'all want some deeper videos to watch so anyways description this video will be in the description <laughs> I don't I can't talk. Um let me know what you think. If you like the video, please subscribe and I will see you in the next one.